right, let's dive into another wild story together. So picture this. There's this young woman named Nicole Peets, and she's got her whole life ahead of her, full of brightness and possibilities. But then, something goes really wrong. It turns out, she gets caught up in a terrible situation involving addiction. Now, addiction might seem like a never-ending problem, but here's the thing. Lots of folks manage to beat it. Take former alcoholics, for example. Many of them kick the habit, get back to normal life, start families, and even help others facing similar struggles. Now, Nicole's story takes a dark turn. It took six long years for the investigators to crack the case wide open. And when they finally had their suspect in court, it took another whole year to prove that he was the one behind a terrible crime. At first, it seemed like the bad guy had everything figured out, like he'd planned the whole thing perfectly. He even went about his life for years, thinking he'd never get caught. But here's the kicker. It was the little details, those tiny pieces of the puzzle that the investigators collected over time, that helped bring him to justice. So let's untangle this crazy story from the very beginning and see how it all went down. Who is Nicole Peets? Nicole Peets was born in King County, Washington, on February 26, 1973. She was the only common child of her parents, whose marriage broke up when the girl was still in school. In high school, Nicole grew up as an active and sociable child, played sports, and was considered a real charmer. She always had a lot of friends, loved trips out of town to the countryside, and her favorite place of rest was Lake Sammamish, located east of Seattle, where she went every year during the summer vacations. After graduating from high school, she went to Western Washington College, where she studied public relations. In parallel, Nicole continued to actively participate in sports, was in excellent physical shape, and decided to turn her hobby into a source of profit. She got a job as a trainer at a local sports club, where she quickly gained the respect of her colleagues and also gained regular clients who willingly attended group classes where Nicole was an instructor. In parallel, Pete's decided to get a higher education in the field of management, and after that, she got a job in a large mobile communications company. Outwardly, she was always friendly, sociable, and ready to help at any moment, but almost no one even guessed how much pain and misery was hidden behind a screen of apparent well-being. Harmful addiction as a teenager, Nicole experienced a serious crisis when her parents divorced. For a fragile yet unformed psyche, it was a great shock. Her rebellious character and bad company led Nicole to hide from problems, numbing them with alcohol. All this led to a serious addiction that lasted several years and thoroughly undermined Nicole's physical and mental health. At that time, Nicole's mother, Gail, worked as a stewardess and was almost constantly absent from home because of her busy work schedule, so she did not notice in time that something was wrong with her only daughter. Nicole lived with an elderly grandmother, who also did not immediately realize that her granddaughter regularly consumed alcohol. When the truth was revealed, alcohol addiction had already managed to do irreparable damage. To cope with the problem, Nicole was helped by her mother, Gail, with whom she had always been very close despite everything. She not only sent her daughter to therapy, but also attended AA meetings with her, helping her to open up and overcome her cravings for alcohol. By then, Gail had remarried, and her new boyfriend, Rod, was sympathetic. He supported his stepdaughter in every way possible, loved her like his own daughter, and believed that she could overcome her addiction. Nicole approached therapy responsibly, did not miss a single meeting, and quickly enough was able to overcome her addiction. However, as I said, alcohol took a toll on Nicole's health. She developed serious problems with her pancreas, so much so that she had to undergo surgery. But the worst thing was that alcohol abuse at such a young age violated the reproductive functions of her body so that Pete's could not have children. In the mid-90s, when Nicole overcame addiction and returned to a sober life, she met her future spouse, whose name was David. At that time, she had just gotten a job at a sports club, and David was a regular visitor there. A tall, handsome young man who carefully watched himself 
and did not miss any training immediately liked Nicole. In turn, he also paid attention to the attractive coach and began to show interest in her. True, David was four years younger than Nicole, but the age difference did not embarrass them. Soon, a romantic relationship began between them that lasted almost eight years, and only in 2002 did the couple marry. They arranged a beautiful but modest wedding ceremony in Hawaii, to which only the closest people to them were invited. After the wedding, the newlyweds settled in the quiet town of Linwood in Washington State, where they bought their own house and gradually settled down. Nicole was a very sociable and friendly young woman. She quickly made friends and also developed good relationships with all the neighbors. She simply adored animals and had several dogs. Since she could not have children, she gave all her unspent maternal love to her pets. According to neighbors' memories, David and Nicole looked like the perfect married couple. They were practically inseparable, often walking their dogs together and just glowing with happiness. Nicole loved to cook, and she was very good at it. She pampered her spouse with delicious home-cooked food and also liked to surprise the guests who came to their house with her culinary skills. In 2006, just a few days before her 33rd birthday, Nicole mysteriously disappeared. On that day, for the first time, she did not come to the meeting of the AA Society, where she was the leader and inspirer of the group. Since this had never happened before, the other members of the group thought she had snapped after almost nine years of sobriety. Pete's also didn't show up for work that day, which worried her co-workers. In the evening, the alarm was sounded by Gail, who couldn't contact her daughter all day, which had never happened before. She called David to find out what had happened, but her son-in-law replied that he couldn't reach his spouse either. According to her husband, he and Nicole had had a bit of a fight the day before. So when he tried to call her the next day and she didn't answer the phone, he assumed that Nicole was still mad at him. It was for this reason that David didn't start looking for her right away, but waited until the evening to ask his wife for forgiveness. After a family quarrel with her husband, Nicole simply decided to leave him or teach him a lesson by making him worry. This version was voiced by Nicole's friends from a support group for people with alcohol addiction. In their opinion, Nicole could have snapped after years of abstinence and sobriety. Supporting this hypothesis was the fact that recently, she had been taking strong painkillers prescribed due to a back injury. Nicole often exceeded her prescribed dosage and at some point may have switched from medication to alcohol. While the search for the vehicle was underway, the police still believed that the car was the main target of the attacker and that traces of the killer should be sought inside the car. Information about the missing car was placed in the media with a request for anyone who sees the car to immediately report it to the hotline. The car was found only a couple of weeks later in one of the parking lots on the outskirts of the city. The unremarkable gray Volkswagen Polo was noticed by the guard on duty because the car had not been taken away for a long time. The guard had no idea it was involved in a murder case. The police immediately took the car for detailed examination and necessary expertise, hoping to find evidence and important clues that would help trace the criminal and restore the picture of the crime. However, the investigators were completely disappointed as nothing could be found in the car. There were no blood traces, signs of struggle, or indications that the car owner was taken somewhere by force. Inside the cabin, there were fingerprints and traces of DNA only from Nicole and her husband who also occasionally used the vehicle. Nevertheless, the investigators were not in a hurry to return the car to David, feeling that the evidence was there but not immediately apparent. The irrefutable fact remained that the young woman was killed with particular cruelty, but the motive of the crime was unclear. The hijacking version now seemed untenable because the car was abandoned almost immediately on the other side of the city, and there were no signs of struggle inside it. The second obvious motive was violence, but this assumption was not confirmed. Experts found that the deceased had no sexual contacts, neither voluntary nor forced, at least a day before the crime. This left the question open as to why she had no clothes on. The third version was some personal motive or acute unpleasant feelings of the perpetrator towards the victim. Numerous injuries inflicted as if in a fit of rage supported this assumption. 
However, the kind and sociable Nicole, eager to help everyone around her, had no enemies or ill-wishers. This difficult case had all chances to remain unsolved because after almost a year, the investigation had no new leads or directions for the search for the criminal. No one saw who abandoned the car in the parking lot. Because the place itself was not crowded and there were no surveillance cameras in the area, what was strange was that the person driving the car was much taller and larger than the victim, as evidenced by the position of the driver's seat. Suspicious was also the fact that the case was assigned the status of secrecy and information about the course of the investigation, as well as new facts and found evidence, was not disclosed even to the relatives of the victim. The mother, stepfather, and husband were in the dark, receiving only fragmentary information. For example, Nicole's bank card was used at a certain gas station in the country after her disappearance. The police requested the footage from the video cameras there, but what they saw on them remained a mystery. Nicole's parents, despairing that there were no results and their daughter's killer was still at large, decided to conduct an independent investigation on their own. To do this, they hired a private detective to gather all the information and verify some of their guesses, announcing a reward of $10,000 for those who provided any useful information on the subject. The reward was later increased to $35,000 but it still didn't help move the case forward. David only showed interest in the investigation for the first six months, but after that, he gradually withdrew, stopped communicating with his mother-in-law and father-in-law, and soon remarried and had an heir. For Gail, this news was a heavy blow because her daughter could not have children, and David constantly reproached his wife for this. The grief-stricken mother repeatedly suggested that the culprit could be her son-in-law, but many believed that her suspicion stemmed from resentment, and the police seemed not to consider this version at all. An unexpected twist in the case came six years after the crime, when it was revealed that David had been taken into custody as the prime suspect. For most people who followed the investigation, this turn was a complete surprise, but not for Nicole's family and friends who had suspected him from the beginning. During the long years of investigation, they seemed disappointed in justice, but now justice had been served. David, who by that time had changed his place of residence and stopped contact with his first wife's family, was discouraged when handcuffs were snapped on his wrists because he thought that the case had long been closed and no one was looking for the criminal. He categorically denied his guilt and even agreed to take a lie detector test, which he failed miserably. As it turned out, the police also suspected David from the beginning, but had no hard evidence proving his guilt. To scare the criminal and make him hide, they did not want to act prematurely. All these years, the investigators were busy collecting pieces of evidence so that the culprit would receive deserved punishment. David himself probably thought he had committed the perfect crime and no one would ever get on his trail. However, the crime had a number of oddities each of which had to be checked. Let's start with the surveillance footage at the gas station, where someone paid with Nicole's card. The footage clearly showed that the card was used by a man who looked very much like David, but it was impossible to identify him clearly because of a headdress and dark glasses. Despite this, the recording was still included in the case file. Another oddity was the absence of Nicole's wedding ring, which she never left the house without. Initially, it was thought that the jewelry was stolen by a criminal, but during a search of the victim's house, the ring was found in a box on the dressing table. Additionally, experts found a special dental mouth guard in Nicole's mouth, which she used during sleep to prevent bruxism. This led the investigation to believe that the victim had been killed in her own bed while still asleep, explaining the lack of clothing and the fact that the body was completely clean with no signs of resistance. There was also no trace of makeup on Nicole's face, which she always applied before leaving the house. David might have forgotten about the mouth guard because his wife had started using it recently. Experts assessed the position of the driver's seat in the found car, concluding that the anthropometric data of the last person who sat behind the wheel matched David's. Only David and Nicole's fingerprints were found in the car. If a third person had been in the cabin, there would have been traces and if they erased them, they would have erased the prints of the car's owners as well. 
Another important discovery was made thanks to the rapid development of technology. After the crime, the perpetrator used the victim's phone in different parts of the city. But signals from David's phone were also present in those same places at the same times. David had a motive. In this seemingly perfect family, a serious crisis had been brewing. While Nicole was studying hard, working two jobs, and helping people cope with addiction, her husband led an idle lifestyle. He never held down a job for long, liked to spend time in bars and clubs, spending his wife's earnings on booze and other women. As a result, the family faced serious financial problems, which only worsened over time. Nicole tried to persuade her husband to change his ways, give up partying, and start attending AA meetings. But David only laughed and called his wife boring. David systematically cheated on his wife with various mistresses and even tried to force Nicole to join them. Gail knew about the horrors in her daughter's family and tried to convince her to leave David. But Nicole, who loved him, hoped he would change. After Nicole's mysterious death, David rushed to get a large insurance payment and immediately started a new affair. A few months before the tragedy, David had an affair with a girl named Jane, spending time with her while Nicole was busy working or studying. Shortly before Nicole's birthday, David brought his mistress home, where they were caught by Nicole, leading to a family quarrel. Nicole told her mother about the incident, and a couple of days later, she disappeared. Gail suspected her son-in-law from the beginning, but the police insisted there was too little evidence to jail him. The case was classified, and the family stopped receiving any information about the investigation. Over the years, the parents lost hope that the culprit would be punished. When David received the insurance payout, he spent it with Jane. Gail suggested that Jane could be an accomplice or the crime's inspirer, but no evidence proving her involvement was found during the investigation. David appeared in court in September 2013, continuing to deny his involvement in the tragedy. His defense lawyers initially insisted that all the evidence against their client was circumstantial and could not unequivocally prove his guilt. When it became apparent that there were too many incriminating factors, the defense changed tactics, trying to portray David as a victim. They brought up Nicole's use of pain pills after a back injury and tried to convince the court that she had started drinking again, making David's life unbearable. These claims were baseless, and everyone who knew Nicole confirmed this. Even if she had snapped, it would not have justified David's actions. David's guilt was eventually fully proven, and he received the maximum possible sentence for his crime, which was 18 years in prison. However, in 2025, he can count on parole after serving two-thirds of his sentence. Subscribe for more chilling cases.